Welcome to episode one of my calculus speed run. In this series, we're gonna be looking at the actual test problems that I've previously given my students, and we're gonna to try to get all the way through calculus. And in this first video, our main topic is limits. So whether you're studying for a test or just want a little bit of a review of calculus, this video is for you. If you have no idea what a limit is, then I would encourage you to check out my full calculus playlist, the link is down in the description, where I introduce all the ideas from the beginning. This is about testing ourselves on the ideal limits. By the way, if you want to try the problems yourself, all of the problems are listed here in this Maple Learn document. So you just click the link down in the description and I'd encourage you to try the problems yourselves. My thanks to Maple Learn for sponsoring today's video and we'll see a little bit more about them as we go through our video. Problem number one. We are gonna consider the following piecewise function. This is the function f of x. To the left, it's this polynomial minus x squared plus six. And to the right, it's c divided by x squared plus one, where here's the trick. C is unknown. Now, we're trying to figure out for what value of C is this function continuous. And before we even write down any computations here, I just want to visually understand what's going on. So what I've done is I've created a slider for this parameter C. And what you'll notice when I go over here and plot it is I have that particular quadratic. And then I also have this, the C over x squared plus 1, but that's going to change as I change the value of C. So we're trying to figure out what value of C it looks like maybe right around there, maybe around 10 is gonna mean that this is gonna nicely line up and be continuous. So that's what I mean graphically, but how do I actually compute this out? I want the limit and the function value to be the same thing at all points. So the interesting spot here is the value of two. And so I want to know that the limit as x goes to the value of two from the right of my function f of x is the same thing as the limit as x goes to two from the left of the function f of x and that all of this is just the same thing as the function value at two. Now, I chose the value two because it was defined to be different things on the left or right of two. If I'm away from two, the functions are clearly continuous. They're rational functions, a spot where there's no zero in the denominator here. So the functions are definitely continuous everywhere else except for this possible problem spot at the value of two. Now, when I am to the right of the value of two, then what I'm gonna have is the expression c divided by x squared plus one. And I'm evaluating it to the right because this is the limit as you go to two from the right. And then what am I doing? I am taking the limit of this as x goes to two from the right. Then if I go to two from the left hand side here, well, this is going to be minus x squared plus six. And then I'm gonna be taking, in fact, the limit of this as x goes to two from the left. And then the equal value, it actually doesn't matter because it's less than or equal to in my description, but if I wanted to plug in two directly, this would be minus two squared plus six, which is equal to two. Now, the point here is that this left-hand limit, I actually can evaluate very nicely. There's no problems. I can just plug in the value of two. And so this is just C divided out by five, two squared plus one. My claim is that this is gonna be equal to two, and thus I get the value of C equal to 10 precisely what my graphical intuition told me. Problem number two. I want to consider the limit as x goes to zero of sine three of x times the cotangent of four of x. What a weird problem. Whenever I write a test, my first goal is always to categorize the classification of problem. And this problem looks weird, except it's one of a standard category. And this category is all about leveraging the following very important limit, one I've written an entire video on previously, the limit as x goes to zero, of sine of x divided by x being equal to one. So I'm gonna write down the limit, but I am going to express the cotangent a little bit more directly in terms of sines and cosines. So the sine three x part, I'm gonna leave that exactly as it was before. But now I'm gonna take that cotangent of four x term and separate this as cosine divided by sine. So this is gonna be on the top, cosine of four x, and then divide it out by sine of x. I'm actually gonna do it this way. I'm gonna divide this out by one here, and then I'm gonna write the sine of four x over here, just so they're all sort of separate out as the product of three things. Now, I said I wanted to use this limit, sine of x divided by x, but there's no x's. So I can just put this in. I can treat this as sine of three x divided by x, and then I'm gonna put another x over here, multiplying on the top and bottom by x, totally allowed. The only problem is I have things like sine of three x and then divide it out by x, which isn't quite right. I have to have 
sine of blah and divided by blah, the blahs have to be the same thing. So what I'm gonna do is the following. I'm gonna put in a three here on the bottom, which is fine, but then I need to keep track of that and cancel it by multiplying on the top. Likewise, I'm gonna put a 4x over here, which is fine as long as I divide out by the 4 as well. So collectively, I've multiplied and divided by x, I've multiplied and divided by 3, I've multiplied and divided by 4, all the same thing. But it lets me look at this and be like, that's just sine blah over blah, and the limit as blah goes to 0, this is just 1. It lets me look at this and say that that is going to be 1 as well. And so the only thing I don't know then is the cosine of 4x term, but in the limit as x goes to 0, cosine is just going to the value of 1. So add this all up, what do I have? I have a 1 times a 1 times a 1 times a 3 quarters, final answer, 3 quarters. Let's check to see whether we're correct. We click on this button, we click evaluate the limit, and what do we get? 3 quarters. This is why maple learning is so helpful to us. We often can get the answers as a verification as we're going along and studying. Problem number three. I want to take the limit as x goes to one of the square root of x squared plus three minus two divided out by x minus one. What a mess. I should perhaps be first clear that I can't just naively plug in the value here of x equal to one. If I do in the bottom, I get zero. And in the top, one squared plus three is four, which square root is two, minus two is zero. It's zero divided by zero in indeterminate form. So I have to do some trickery. Now, I see the square root and I immediately think I want to do the radical conjugate. So I've written it down again and I'm going to write by the conjugate and it works like this. You see what's a square root minus something? I'm going to multiply by x squared plus three, the same square root, but I'm going to write plus two instead. Same at the bottom, square root of x squared plus three plus two. This is the radical conjugate and it's just a funny version of one. Like, how do we even come up with this? But this is a little bit about our pattern recognition. When I see these kind of differences where one of them is a square root, this is the kind of algebraic trickery that comes to mind. Now, let's see why it's so nice. If I multiply this out on the top, okay, copying and pasting, the limit as x goes to one, nothing's changing there. Multiply it on the top, what I get? x squared plus three. I then have two cross terms, a minus two times the square root of x squared plus three, and then a plus two times the square root of x squared plus three. The plus and the minus cancel, and so all the cross terms go away, and then minus two times two is gonna be minus four, divided out by x minus one, square root of x squared plus three plus two on the bottom. So what I've really done is I've made the denominator messier and the numerator more simple. Indeed, I can clean up that numerator even more. This is x squared minus one. And x squared minus one is x minus one, x plus one. So this can be rewritten as limit, x goes to one, of x minus one, x plus one, all divided out by x minus one, times the square root of x squared plus three, plus two. And what's remarkable here is I have an x minus one factor on an x minus one factor on the bottom, which at least in the limit, when you're away from the value of one, those are going to cancel. So I've got rid of my zero. Now if I plug in the value of x equal to one, on the top, I'm just gonna get the value of two, x plus one is gonna be two. On the bottom, I'm gonna have square root of four is two, two plus two, this is gonna be equal to four, in other words, one half. Let's check it one more time. I'm going to click on it. I'm going to evaluate the limit and let's see, I get the value of one half once again. Problem number four also appears to have a whole bunch of square roots in it. Kind of interesting, but this time it is a limit as x goes to infinity and not x to a finite value like one. And, and so the method I'm going to use when you see the infinity there is quite a bit different. When I look at this limit, when I look at this limit and I try to think what happens as you get really large, let's just look for example in the denominator. I have a two x and a minus one. When x is a number very, very large, tending towards infinity, the minus one doesn't matter at all. Same in the numerator. The minus two doesn't matter at all. And in fact, neither does that four x because the three x squared is gonna grow so much faster than the four x is gonna be when x is an enormous number, a billion, a trillion, and so on. And so I have an almost very quick answer to this, and we're gonna do a bit more of a rigorous one in a moment. My quick answer is just say, look at the highest power of x on the top, the highest power of x on the bottom. On the top, it's the square root of x squared, which is just x, and on the bottom, it's two x. So, so both things proportional to x. 
I just look at the coefficients, well, the coefficient here is square root of 3, and then on the bottom it's 2, so my guess to the answer is square root of 3 divided by 2. But I do want to do just a little bit more just to sort of justify that answer to you. So the trick is, I'm going to multiply on the top and the bottom by 1 divided out by x. By the way, depending on your calculus teacher, this level of work sometimes is and sometimes is not required, so I want to show you the full level of work to make sure that you can do it and you can get your test and ace it regardless. If I then factor this 1 over x through, so again, the highest power on the top and the bottom, limit as x goes to infinity, okay, so what do I have on the top? Square root of 3, and then 1 over x inside a square root becomes 1 over x squared, then plus 4 divided by x, and then minus 2 divided out by x. On the bottom, I get 2 minus 1 divided by x. And then here's the point. In limit as x goes to infinity, that is 0. That is 0, and that is 0. Final answer, square root of 3 divided by 2. Problem number 5. We're going to look at the limit as x goes to 1 from the right of e to the 1 minus x. This is often one of the trickier ones for my students. Now, part of this is all about playing around with the graphs of things that you know. So let me just start with e to the power of x. So we've seen this graph, it's e to the x, and it, it looks a little bit like that. Okay, so, so that's the exponential part, but really what I can do if I'm going to take the limit as x goes to 1 from the right of e to the 1 over 1 minus x, is I can use the property that e is a continuous function, and this is just the same thing as e to the limit as x goes to 1 to the right of 1 over 1 minus x. So I'm going to figure out that inside, and then I can take the e to the x, and I, I know what the graph of that's going to be. I can similarly plot here the plot of 1 over 1 minus x, and it looks like this business. And now it should become clear why I cared about the fact that it was coming from the right. So if I'm coming from the right, from 1 minus x, at the value of 1, I spike down to minus infinity. So this is sort of bad notation, but the way I'm going to write this is this is like e to the minus infinity. Maybe I'll put it in quotation marks to say I'm being a little bit ad hoc with it. And we know what happens to e to the x is you go to the value of minus infinity. This is just the value of zero. And let's see whether Maple Learn agrees. I'm going to click on it and I'm going to evaluate my limit. And indeed, I get the value of zero. All right, I very much hope that you enjoyed the first episode of my calculus speed run. If you did, give it a like for the YouTube algorithm, because YouTube likes algorithm just as much as us mathematicians do. Check out Maple Learn, the sponsor of today's video, and we'll do some more math in the next video.